Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the Ask Weldon Show. This is the show where you call in questions and I answer them. The topics usually related to sports psychology for eSport, eSport psychology, or League of Legends or League of Legends coaching, those kind of things. Uh, today we have a mega show because it's been a few months since I was able to last do an episode. Uh, I'll do four questions today and I'm going to try to catch up to the current questions. So I think there's probably about three or four shows that I can do this week with pre-banked questions back from July and August. And then I'm going to have to rely on you guys calling in your new questions. So be sure to check that out. You can call in your question using the Anchor app. Uh, there'll be a URL for that a little bit farther on in the show. And I'll do announcements after the first question. So why don't we just jump right into it? First question comes from Ryan. Uh, Hi, Weldon. Someone I'm currently working with is having a hard time discovering his performance values or his motivation to keep going when the governor in his mind says, he's done enough. Do you have any tips for someone struggling to identify their own performance values? All right. So essentially, Ryan's question is, how do I do sports psychology for my friends? So performance values, for those of you who haven't taken my Mac program, uh, performance values are the things that essentially you know, uh, they're kind of like goals, okay? The difference between values and goals are that goals are things you can check off and witness and see, and you can only do them when you can do them. Whereas values are things that you can live out all the time. So for example, a goal would be, I want to compete and win the game. And a value would be, I want to be a competitor, so at any point in the game, you can have the mindset of a competitor and you can really fight for the ball and you can like be like, okay, just because this guy beat me doesn't mean I'm just going to give up and let him run down the field with the ball. Like I can keep chasing him, right? So my performance value is I'm a competitor, which even though I'm losing, I lost the ball to this guy one-on-one -on -one and he like is taking it and he's taking it down. I can still live out my value of being a competitor by like chasing him. Whereas if you have a goal, which is to like, uh, beat this guy one-on-one -on -one or to win the game, then you can really only like live that out if your goalie blocks the shot, right? And you achieve your goal uh, of, of winning the game. So performance values are essentially things that are inherent to how, it, how you are as a competitor. And the best ones to choose are ones that will lead into the goals that you want to accomplish because then you'll be living them out and you can accomplish them on the day-to-day -day and you know that at the end of the street there is the actual level that you want to get to uh, whether it's through accomplishment or through uh you know through success or through um the realization of your own like identity in the game uh so how do you help a friend identify performance values well i think we have a pretty complex worksheet in the mac program that you're supposed to do uh, I think that that worksheet maybe has not been linked to the lesson. I'm not really sure if it's like still tied up in the website or if it fell away. But the basic idea is you ask yourself uh, how you would want to be remembered as a, at the, let's say, I think that we do it like, how do you want to be remembered on your tombstone? Like when somebody's giving your eulogy at the end of your life, what the, the, this person was, Weldon was a blank kind of person and he was known for um, doing things like blank. Uh, doing things this way or that way. Uh, not things that he achieved, but things the way that he lived out his life. He was what kind of father? He was what kind of friend? He was what kind of competitor? Uh, and then you would dial it back and be like, it's the end of your career. You are being retired in the Hall of Fame. What kind of player were you? How do your teammates describe you in like a press piece where they're like talking about you going into retirement? Like what kind of person or teammate or athlete were you? Um and then you dial it back to the season and you say like, okay, what, how do you live out those values like on a season level? Uh, and then you dial it back to the day and you're like, okay, well, given how I want people to describe me at the end of my career and how I want the season to go, what do I do today? How do I live out my values in the day-to-day, minute-to-minute that lead into those uh, realities? So that's kind of like the, how the activity is structured to discover that. And that's what you could suggest that to your friend. Uh, but you'll be basically doing sports psychology training. So you should not look at it as like a casual conversation and you should not invite him into a casual conversation. You should invite him into like, hey, I want to work with you on this thing, this concept. It's going to take mental work. It's going to be sweaty and gritty and you're going to have to share some things that you might not want to talk about with me. 
Uh, so you got to be ready for that. Uh, if you like, they have to be willing to talk about this stuff with you too. So, uh, mentally prepare for that conversation and prepare your friend for that kind of work. Um, because it's not just, it's not just, you know, an average conversation you would have with a buddy, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you for that question, Ryan. Uh, jumping into announcements. So it's the end of the season. Season is over for CLG. We lost and it's very, very aggravating and frustrating and disappointing, but we don't get to participate in the world's postseason, so we have to watch it from afar. And right now, every single thing that I hear about League of Legends is pissing me off. I don't want to hear about any of it um, because we're not there to compete. And uh, so I'm sure that I'm not sure that I know that I have to force myself to watch anyway and enjoy it and that'll, that'll fade away. And that's just kind of like the cycle of life. But anyway, um, I'm not really sure if I want Clutch to win the World Championship or I want to get, to get stomped, like, brutally in the first stage. Um, I think I'm only okay with either extreme. Um, and uh, anyway, that's happening. So other than that, I'm going to try to jump back into my stream here. I'm going to be trying to uh, be uh, putting up a show with you guys regularly, this Mind Games uh, Ask Weldon show, and I'm going to be trying to work on my app, the the Mac Weldon's Mac app, which you can right now buy as a course version. So if you want to buy it as a course, you'll hear more about that later. And I'm going to be probably streaming some video games too, uh, starting today with some Apex Legends. So check that out. And also going to TwitchCon on Saturday. Uh, other than that, I don't really have any other announcements. So let's jump into question number two. This one also is from Ryan. Ryan tends to call in his questions in batches. So thank you for that. Hi, Weldon. As a long-term gamer or long-time gamer, I've spent more than my fair share of times indoors. How important is it that I make time to go out into nature and how might this affect my performance life? This is a really good question. Uh, so the way that nature affects uh, health right now is essentially through well-being. So there, there was a groundbreaking study that looked at, with a controlled group, the perception of pain and the prevalence of, like, the speed of recovery time for people who had uh, basically a white, completely white, like, featureless office versus... Uh, a office with a scenic na nature mural versus an office with like other distracting stuff. So like a control. And uh, what they found was that the perception of pain was less and that recovery was faster for people who had nature. And this is since this groundbreaking discovery has uh, since been replicated with places with windows and stuff like that. Um, and so it is known that there's an interaction between the human mind and nature that is beneficial to perception to perception. So perceptions of pain, perceptions of uh, of effort and how hard something is, etc. And that can lead to stuff like um, better recovery and less experiences of pain, etc. So I think that nature is definitely a part of our recovery system. And I would recommend that if you're trying to reset between training games, going on a walk in a treadmill in a basement, watching a video versus going on, on a walk in nature are qualitatively different things and will do different things for you recovery-wise. So I will always recommend nature as a part of a full recovery package. However, it's hard to quantify exactly what that is on the, on the short term and it's specifically in performance settings because it hasn't really been researched and the effect is always going to be this long gradual kind of thing. So the the answer is yes, it's necessary for humans. Therefore, it's necessary for performance. Um, and no, it will not make you an Olympic athlete if you just start taking walks out in the woods. But yeah, that's the answer to that. Thanks for the question and the interesting insight. And let's jump into oh right Mac program. So this is the class I was talking about. Uh, essentially, it's mindfulness, acceptance, commitment, training. This is the program that I do with did the teams that I have previously been employed with. So CLG, TSM, G2, uh, Team Liquid. And the essential concept here is that you learn poise and you learn performance uh, performance skills that are necessary for your training and for your, uh, your success on stage and, and your ability to learn the game 
uh, or the sport or public speaking or whatever it is performance related that you're doing at a higher rate and with more without with less barriers and less roadblocks that you put up for yourself uh, mentally. So the way that this happens is through 49 daily classes over 49 days. Uh, obviously, daily classes over 49 days. Okay, anyway, uh, there's 49 sessions, seven seven modules with seven uh, sessions each. And right now, it's simply a video course. And each video is composed of a lecture and a mind seated mindfulness training section. And I'm turning it into an app, and I'm anywhere between twenty and $30,000, I think, invested into the coding of that. But due to the move to North America, it's been put on hold as I'm saving up for finishing it. So any support that you do in terms of purchasing, obviously that money goes straight into the, the war chest for polishing off the app and getting that launched. And also, by the way, the deal has been that everybody who buys the course just gets the app forever for free. So you don't have to buy it again. You don't have to subscribe to it as it's going to be a subscription product, et cetera, et cetera. You just kind of like get in as a, it's kind of like I'm kickstartering my own app, right? Anyway, so thank you to the uh, thousands and thousands, uh, now 3,500 people who have supported Mind Games up to this point, supported the course and helped with the development of that app. And um, thank you to those of you who are considering it. And I'm sure it will be beneficial for you as well. Not just beneficial for the people who get to benefit from the app being developed. So anyway, let's jump into question number three. Oh, and you can check that out, mindgames.gg, and please use the coupon code AskWeldon, A-S-K-W-E-L-D-O-N, and uh, that will show people that you came from this YouTube video. Hey, Weldon. I was wondering, how do I stay focused on a gaming session? Usually when I'm playing, I would be focused for 20 to 30 minutes, but then find myself watching random YouTube videos or just going through Twitter, and I would end up practicing way less than I wanted to originally. Thank you. All right, so this question is uh, one related to motivation. And so you really, this is the, I think if anybody could answer this question that, you know, they would solve human crises like everybody would be an olympic athlete if they knew how to stay focused on their training but not everybody's an olympic athlete so some people are more motivated than other than others so i i would say this this question has two answers number one if you can't stay focused on training maybe you aren't motivated enough to want it that badly that you're going to stay focused on training and therefore maybe you should consider being excellent at other things so what i'm saying is maybe it's fine you're not focused on training so you just go and watch YouTube videos. So maybe video games is something you do for fun and you have to accept the level that you're going to be at as a fun player and you should go work on your trombone or um, practice your skateboarding or do your coursework or whatever it is that like, or work on a YouTube video, whatever it is that's like pulling you, like pay attention to your motivation. So whenever I get a lot of people who get signals and they're like, hey, how do I do this thing that I'm not doing and I'm doing this other thing instead all the time? I'm like, well, maybe your motivation is pointing you towards that other thing. So you should go do that and not worry about the thing that you're not doing. So don't be defined by like the thing that you're you're not motivated to do and instead do the thing that you uh, just do naturally because you want to do it so badly. Okay, so that's answer number one. Answer number two, how do you stay focused? You know this is the thing you want to do. You know you're motivated by it. You just keep like uh, ADDing away to like into other stuff. And I use that not as a clinical term, but as like a like a conversational term, right? I don't mean like you're actually ADDing. I mean, you know, you're just getting distracted. So for this, you need to um, essentially practice working on ignoring impulses of self-satisfaction. So you get these triggered feedback loops of dopamine such as um answering a text or getting a ding on your phone or seeing a notification message or going into clash royale and you know all the little things are like just constantly you sit down and you just automatically open up twitter and you click on the thing and like these are all dopamine loops so the best way to do this is to is to achieve mastery over these kind of loops and realize that you do and do not what you do and don't really actually need you don't need these and i think personally the best way to experience these realities is through fasting because a lot of people just come up with excuses they're like oh it's so hard oh i can't do that but like once you, and, and people are like 
brutalized by the idea of, for example, not eating food. They're like, oh, you're going to die. But if you just fast for five days, you'll be like, oh, wow, well, I'm alive. Nothing really happened. Lost a little weight. Then at the end, I ate and I gained a little weight. And But in the meanwhile, you go through this intense mental journey of like denial, right? Self-denial. Uh, and food is one of those things that is so hard to deny. And if you can deny that, you can definitely say no to a YouTube video that's making you feel good. Um, and you can do fasting from phone. So for example, I don't need that or Twitter or social media. You can just, no, just none for a week. Just fast from it. Just turn it off, right? Uh, and you'll like, it's kind of like getting sugar out of your diet. It'll be gone. And then the first time you taste it, you'll be like, oh, that's sweet. Like too sweet, you know? Uh, so... Um, and you'll also be like, oh, like really, really hyper. So you'll see a YouTube video and you'll realize like, oh, this is so distracting. Like I used to have this like pure contented zone of like non bleh. And then all of a sudden you put media back into it and you're like, ah, oh, the brain. I remember I used to take walks and it was really, really like I just I couldn't take a walk without my headset. Like I was so bored. It was like an hour from this university to my house. And um, I I would face with dread the day I would forget my headset and I'd know I'd have to walk an hour home all by myself, like without music, without a podcast, without anything, just like nothing but like staring to the side, like very inefficient, right? Um, but then I started meditating on my walks and then I got to the point where like I would, you know, I was, I was like losing myself in just the movement of my legs, you know, and the, and the feeling of the pavement and the bottom of my feet, uh, through my shoes, obviously, and socks, and oftentimes boots because it was snowy, uh, whatever. Anyway, and then one day I, I was like, I didn't, uh, I'd already meditated or something, and so I didn't need to. And this was like, you know, months and months and months, this. And um, and so I like, I remember turning on music or turning on a podcast or something, and it lasted about a, about 50 seconds before I was like, oh, this is like, just, 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 it's just so much inundation of, nonsense and i turned it off and i went back to this the, the pureness of just being alone and focusing not even with my thoughts right i was just trying to obfuscate thoughts just being just being just existing and there was so much in that existing like there was the traffic and there was the sound and there was the constant feeling of sensation and balance and there was the the sky and just like everything and it was just this insane inpouring of sensory input that i was constantly processing and paying attention to and like the the entertainment media was just like this nonsense noise compared to the the fullness of that experience so you will notice after fasts like that this desensitization to this kind of media uh, i would assume so that is my other answer that's answer number b to your question gerald um and uh, i hope that that is helpful and thank you for calling in your question. And so I was going to do a like a mega show today um, and do four questions, but I forgot to work up the, uh, what do you call it? The overlay for the fourth question. So I'm just going to play the audio and we can listen to it together for the fourth question for today's show, which is from Shrieker. Shrieker, Shrieker, Shrieker. I'm not sure. Hey, Weldon. Hi. Uh, I just want to know what's what are your recommendations on how to get into coaching into the league scene right now, and if there were any suggestions you'd have. Thank you. Okay, so this is kind of like a job consulting question, and the and the and the basic answer is you have to get into professional coaching by networking. So if you want to get into professional League of Legends coaching, there are currently twenty jobs, and those twenty positions are filled with people who are either already doing them or network into them through uh, pro players. So pro players who have had the benefit of working with you and feel that you would be a very good coach recommend you and then you get interviewed by the org uh, who hires you even if they don't like you because the players are like, yeah, we need this guy because he helped us win. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty narrow career path. If you're talking about just getting into coaching in general, then the way that you get in is you just start coaching. So just go down to your local Y and start coaching a rock climbing team, whatever it is. It doesn't really matter. Just start getting in front of people and coaching them. And then you can work up that. So you can either go into coaching sciences and study coaching and do professional coaching like I did and then work your way into esport. Or you can work your way up through a specific genre of esport as a hobbyist coach. 
where you just coach league teams and then and then you try to coach a high school league team and then a university league team and then you get a paid position as a university league team coach and whatever and you take one-on-one clients until you get to that point you coach people one-on-one you volunteer coach teams such as what i did which is i did a lot of volunteer coaching of league of legends teams in 2014 up until i got my first paid gig um and uh or you can you can treat it as some sort of um uh side thing where it's serendipity and you just try to get as high ranked player as you can and then you start trying to network your way into people who have influence in college teams to get a college position as a coach and then you turn that into um uh you just try to identify players that you think are going to go pro and then you coach them and then when they go pro they get you a job as a coach that's kind of like basically the only way in that i can think of right now uh unless you know somebody on an esport org with a disproportionate amount of power more than a pro player would have uh thanks for the last question so that's the show for today i'm gonna jump back into the twitch stream make sure to check this show out live on twitch twitch.tv slash mind games well then um and so go go to there and follow now because the show is at a random time i don't have like a regular schedule for it yet maybe i will in this off season but you kind of got to turn on notifications in your twitch app on your phone so that you just pops up and when i go live i try to do it with the title of the show and then and then i record the show and you can like ask questions in twitch chat and then i will hang out with you afterwards and answer them so that's where i'm headed right now and youtube i will see you later